Well, I'm excited. I don't know about you, um, and I've had a lot of caffeine today, so I'm probably just going to talk fast, unlike normally. I wanted to speak to you today about something that's been on my heart. Um, I'm, a, I'm a pastor's kid and a missionary's kid, so I grew up going to church whether I liked it or not. How many PKs do we have here in the room? Right, so you know what it's like to just hear sermons every Sunday and every Wednesday and every time you do something wrong and every time you do something right and every time that your dad is just practicing out a new message. So I've heard thousands of them. And what it seems to me is that most preachers, and I, this is not probably true, but what it always seemed to me as a young kid growing up was that when people spoke, they were preaching from a place of strength and they were preaching from something that they had figured out and they were gonna share with the rest of us. As I've gotten older, I've realized probably they didn't do that at all. But from my perspective, that's what it was. I'm not that way. I tend to usually speak about things that I'm going through. Part of that is I'm passionate about that. Uh, there's a lot of material because the Holy Spirit is speaking to me. Part of it is if I'm feeling the pain of the Holy Spirit putting pressure on me, then I would like to share that pain with you guys. And that way we can all suffer together. So I wanna share with you something that I actually think it's, it's meaningful for the, this group right now. And it was the word that, a word that God dropped on my heart um, as probably the first day after they asked me to speak when I was praying about what I would share. And it's coming out of the life of Jacob. You can put this first slide up there if you guys got my PowerPoint that I sent you. Um, I have a, a mixed feelings about Jacob. You know, Jacob, we're talking about Jacob in the Bible. How many of you are familiar with the story of Jacob? Just because it's like 10 chapters in the Bible. It goes on and on and on. He's one of the most entertaining characters there. But I have mixed feelings because he's kind of a snake, honestly. Um, at least by Western standards. Here in the West, we like our heroes to be bold and action-packed and a little rebellious and on the edge and confrontational with authority and all that. So that's kind of the, the stereotype, especially in action movies, of a, of a good leader. It's not necessarily biblical, but that's what we like. Jacob was not that kind of guy. Um, I, I don't, how many of you play Call of Duty? Okay, mature people play Call of Duty. It says it right there on the thing. It says M for mature. So if you're mature, you play Call of Duty. All right. How many of you, have ever, if you've done this, have ever gotten shot across the map by a sniper? So annoying, so stinking frustrated. They're hiding in the bushes, just waiting for you to come around the corner and you're dead. All right, drives me bananas. Uh, the issue is I actually use a sniper like 99.9% .9 of the time, so I'm a total hypocrite. And it's nothing, there's nothing more fun than shooting somebody when they're not expecting it. But we don't like it when that sort of thing happens to us. We, don't, we like our leaders to be direct and our heroes to be aggressive and in your face and bold. And Jacob is not that kind of guy. So he's a patriarch who has some major problems and he's, he's kind of sneaky. Um, but I have mixed feelings in part because I see, well, there are certain similarities. Um, he's a twin. I'm actually a twin. Most people don't know that here, but I'm a twin. He's second born, I'm second born. He's competitive, I'm pretty competitive. He couldn't grow facial hair <laughs> and I can't grow facial hair either. <laughs> I, I did, I got a couple, it took a long time. But I also see myself a lot more deeply than that in some of the ways that Jacob acted, both good and bad. And I wanna share it because I think it's not just me. I think actually it's gonna resonate with many of you. First of all though, uh, Simon inspired me in his message to put up a photo, some nostalgia. So if you can throw up the next, next uh, picture there. There was a year when I was, I think my sophomore year of, of the next slide of PBC. And there it is. They did a siblings page because so many of us were siblings at PBC and so they asked for photos of the two of us. And back then you didn't have digital cameras and so we didn't have a photo of the two of us. And so we had to get two separate photos and, and give them to them. We didn't want to take another one and then go to the store and get it developed and pay all the money. It was a different, it was a different era. So I, Judah, Ariana, Koya, keep your mouth shut and your hands down. But the rest of you, which one is me and which one is Justin? Let's see how smart you actually are, all right? I know they're both good looking so it's hard to tell. Raise your hand if you think the top one is Justin and the bottom one is Jeff. I'm Jeff, just to clarify. <laughs> okay, which, raise your hand if you think that the top one is Jeff and the bottom one is Justin. Wow, that's a lot more that way. All right, to tell you the truth, they're both Jeff. <laughs> it wasn't really a lie, but when they asked for sibling photos, we just gave them two photos of me, and they never had a clue. Just found it in the yearbook the other day when we were going through stuff. I'm like, yeah, that was a good one. All right. So I do, I think, share a little bit with Jacob because um, I can be a little bit sneaky, I suppose. Um, but that was, that was a fairly innocent one, I think. Anyway, so there's two of us. Um, I want to jump into the story. So if you've got your Bibles, you can open with Genesis chapter 25. I'm not going to read everything because it's literally 10 chapters long. We don't have that kind of time. But I'm going to hit a couple of highlights. First of all, just the backstory. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Oh, okay, it's not showing there, so I never know unless I turn around, so, all right. Uh, he's a son of Isaac and the grandson of Abraham, so he's in a long line already of people that God has chosen 
to be the carriers of his covenant, to move this covenant forward, to be a blessing to the nations, and he would know that. But he's the younger twin of Esau. He was chosen by God to inherit the Abrahamic blessings, and he was, he was kind of a snake, frankly. Uh, you can show the next photo. Actually, this is an artistic reproduction of <laughs> Jacob and Esau. Seriously, though, if, if Jacob was in the MCU, that's who it would be. All right, if you haven't seen the Marvel movies, I'm sorry. But that tends to be what he's like. Can we switch to the next slide now? I want to jump into the, the scripture because I know we don't have a ton of time compared to how many pages of notes I have. Uh, Genesis chapter 25. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. And the Lord answered his prayer and his wife, Rebecca, became pregnant. The babies jostled within each other, or each other within her, and she said, why is this happening to me? Okay, time out just for one second. Jostled is a really polite way of saying this. It's not probably the most accurate. I actually looked back into it and did a little bit of research, studied my Greek and Hebrew and all that stuff. And the commentators say the better word for jostled would be smashed. In fact, it's usually translated crushed almost everywhere else in the Bible. Jostling is when there's too many kids in the back seat and you're kind of, you know, nudging each other and like, he's in my space and she touched me and stop breathing. That's jostling. These guys were full on MMA, like they were cage fighting for nine months, <laughs> right? They were trying to kill each other in the womb. I mean, the Hebrew word actually means to crush one another. So I imagine, because I have a vivid imagination, poor Rebecca, who's never had a kid, doesn't know she's got twins, most likely, because it's not like they had ultrasounds back then. She doesn't know what to expect. All she knows is her belly is like doing this all the time, and things keep hurting because she's getting kicked in the ribs repeatedly like a machine gun in there. She has no idea what's going on. And so you, I, I imagine her like, you know, sitting down to eat with Isaac, and, and her, her stomach is just doing these things, and she's like, Arr! and Isaac's like, what's the matter, you know? And she's like, you did this to me. <laughs> and he wisely stays, just keeps his mouth shut. Inside the womb, two kids are trying to murder each other. Now the problem is, think this through, you're in a liquid-filled sack, with umbilical cord attaching yourselves to your mother. It's basically like two baby astronauts just floating around in zero G, just. <laughs> All right, so in my mind, it's like two of the cutest, adorable little baby astronauts, but they would like to kill each other. And so they're having this nine-month fight of like. <clears throat> and every time one of them does something, poor Rebecca feels it. At some point, Esau's like kicks and Jacob grabs onto the heel because this isn't, when he comes out, that's not the first time he's done that. He's been practicing that move for months. So then Esau's shaking him off, you know, and an elbow to the face, and they both off, bounce off backwards, and you could carry it on for quite a while. Jacob bounces off of Rebecca's kidney, and, you know, Esau's trampolining on the bladder, and Rebecca's probably hating life. This is why I don't pay attention in sermons very well, is because when I start thinking about this sort of stuff. <laughs> it would have been hilarious for everybody but Rebecca, though. I mean, honestly. So that's, that's, the, that's the story. So she's confused. She knows this is, this is not normal. Something's happening in my stomach, and it doesn't feel good. So she goes and inquires of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other and the elder will serve the younger. It actually it literally says the greater will serve the lesser. So there's a little bit of ambiguity in there at that point. They may not have actually known that the younger was gonna be the, the, the one on, who was gonna come out on top, but they knew that there was gonna be a, a switch of what would normally take place. When the time came to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. So I'm still imagining the cage fight, right? And the kids, you know, and at one point Jacob was like, ah, and kicks Esau, and Esau goes straight for the exit. And as he's going out head first, Jacob's like, that's not gonna happen, and he grabs onto his foot. And so you got the midwife back there, and she's just getting ready to, to, to play catcher here. Out comes something, you know, and Rebecca, she says, Rebecca's like, what is it? You know, she's holding this, it literally says right here, that he came out, like a, his whole body was like a hairy garment. So she's like, well, I don't know. Bigfoot, something. I'm not really sure what came out. Oh, and there's a weasel hanging on because there's Jacob right below it. It was the strangest birth ever. Rebecca's just happy to be have it done finally, you know, like they're out. And they're wrapped up there in swaddling claws or whatever you did back then, just sitting there looking at each other, just. <laughs> right, Esau's like, I won. Jacob's like, not for long, you know. And Isaac's like, oh, look, he's waving his hand at Jacob, at, at, at this older brother. Why is his middle finger up? I don't know. Because there was animosity from the very beginning. Okay, now probably that didn't happen, but you get the idea. There was literally, in the Bible, even clear that there was struggle from the beginning to the end. And Jacob would have grown up, because Jacob's name means he who grabs by the heel. Esau's means Harry. So the poor guy, it's just not a great choice of names. But in both cases, there was from the very beginning an acknowledgement of their identity that was based in that situation that took place. So Jacob's whole growing up years would have been marked by that. Every time someone says the name Jacob, it's a memory that he didn't win that he didn't get what he wanted, 
that he's the second born, he's the afterthought, he's the, the, the one that is gonna just kind of be also ran, the runner up. Every single time someone says his name, and it's a, it's a funny enough story that I'll bet you every time they had guests come over, they're telling the story of when Jacob and Esau were born, you know, and Jacob came out grabbing Esau by the heel, <laughs> and Jacob's just like, Argh. because to him, it wasn't just a game, he wanted to win, and he couldn't, it was out of his control. And so he's watching his brother growing up with the privileges and the prestige of being the firstborn. And to make it worse, it says here in verse 27, the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, which was a highly recognizable and valued skill for men in that culture. A man of the open country, well, Jacob actually kind of just liked to cook, right? Salmon for the win. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So not only is Jacob dealing with the fact that he isn't the firstborn, but his father doesn't like him that much. So there's clear favoritism going on from the very beginning. I don't know where you've come from in your background, but our backgrounds do mark us. When we grow up feeling like we're not loved for who we are, we're not cared about because of our position in life or our background or, or what birth order we had, it's destructive. And it can begin to eat away at us. And in Jacob's mind, in his life, what we see happening is he becomes obsessed with figuring out how to get what he wants any way he possibly can. It's not being handed to him on a silver platter. He's not like Esau, who just because he happened to be born first is gonna get the privilege of owning everything and being responsible and being the leader and having the prestige. He's like, I'm gonna fight for it and I'm gonna get it. And that becomes his mentality. But he's not direct about it. He's not gonna be able to beat up his brother and, over, and, and, and fight him. Obviously, Esau is the hunter. <laughs> Wouldn't work well. So he becomes more devious about it. You can go to the, the next slide. And you know the story, I won't spend a lot of time on it, but you begin to see numerous things that Jacob does to get what he wants. And the first one is Esau comes in starving to death after a long hunt, must not have gotten anything. He comes back and Jacob's been cooking up a great stew and it smells wonderful and it looks wonderful. And Esau goes, give me some of that. And Jacob's like, sure, if you give me your birthright. And Esau's like, sure. And you're like, what the heck, Esau? Why would you do that? And the narrator actually, normally narrators don't jump in here. This isn't like a Disney movie. But in this case, the narrator actually says, and so Esau despised his birthright. So what Esau was given on a silver platter, he didn't actually care about that much. Later on in the New Testament, it's very clear that God chose Jacob, not Esau, before they'd ever done anything. So Jacob wasn't chosen because he was great or he was mighty or he was smart. He was chosen because God wanted to choose Jacob. But that doesn't mean that Esau lost his free will. Esau had a choice still, and he chose to give it up. He's like, I don't really care. I want the food. I want the pleasure right now. Give me the stew. You can have the dumb birthright. And Jacob's like, yes, because he knew what he wanted, and he'd been fighting for it for years, looking for his opportunity. Then later on, you know the story probably where Esau decides he's going to die, which is not true. He lives for like 20 more years, but he thinks he's going to die. Must have been having a bad day. Probably Googled his symptoms on WebMD and decided that stomach ache was going to kill him. And so he calls Esau and says, I want to bless you, which by the way is just more favoritism. He's not blessing Jacob. When Jacob gets ready to die, he blesses every one of his 12 children. When Abraham was old, he gave gifts to all of his children, not just the chosen one. But Isaac is like, I'm just going to bless Esau. So you see more evidence of Jacob growing up in this home that's, that's not only not ideal, it's full on dysfunctional. And Rebecca, who loves Jacob, was like, ha <laughs> challenge accepted, we're gonna fix that. And so she could go through the whole story where she kills the goat and puts the hair on, Jacob becomes hairy for the first time in his life, he deceives, he, it's a strange story. And you know, the whole time you're like, Esau just, or Isaac, just how dumb do you have to be not to realize that's Jacob wearing a goat? But anyway, they get through it, Jacob steals the, the, the blessing now, Sorry that I'm rushing through it, but it's 10 chapters, and I, I know most of you are familiar. And for the next almost 15 years, Jacob first runs for his life and then spends 14 years with, his, with Laban in a constant battle which back and forth trying to get, to get what he wants. And there's multiple stories in there that I wish I could tell because they're so, so funny. But the idea behind all of it is the same. Jacob knows what he wants, but he thinks he has to do all the work to get it by any means necessary. So he'll cut corners, he'll blow up relationships, he will lie and cheat and steal. He will do everything he can to get what he wants because he's never learned to trust God. Now from the very beginning, in fact from before his birth, God has promised that he was gonna bless him. And as Jacob is fleeing from Laban, or excuse me, from, from Esau in, in Bethel, in Genesis 28, God actually gives him a dream. And if you're familiar with the story, there's angels going up and down a staircase to heaven. And God repeats to Jacob all the blessings that he was going to give to Abraham. He makes it clear, I'm going to give to you and through you, Jacob. Through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed as well. It's just a powerful blessing. And Jacob's like, whoa. He wakes up and he goes, okay, this was a, this was a presence of God. Builds a little altar. And then he says, if God will bring me safely back to this place. If God will be with me, will go with me, will provide food for me, will take care of me, and will bring me back safely, 
then he will be my God and I'll give him a tenth of all my possessions. So God just said, this is what I'm gonna do. And Jacob's like, okay, well, if you do it all, then at the very end, I'll, I'll go ahead and we'll make an agreement that you can be my God. Like, he's still bargaining. He's, he's negotiating with God. I'll tithe if you do all this. God's like, I already said I was gonna do it. This isn't a negotiation. This is just me saying, this is what I'm giving you. All you have to do is say yes. But Jacob is, is unable to relinquish control. He's convinced that he's got to be the one to make it happen. And he spends 14 years with Laban learning just how, how terrible of an idea that actually is. God does bless him. And he does actually gain riches, and he gains more wives than anybody ever needed, um, a ridiculous number of kids. But throughout all of that, he's still struggling to ever understand that God is his God. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. This is what I wanna, where I want to bring it in to, to, to myself personally and to us. Jacob needed control. So do we. At least I do. I have found that the desire to control my environment whether that be my present, my future, my relationships, my reputation, my finances, to, that desire to control can sometimes become a, something that rules my life without me even realizing it. It's sneaky, it's subtle. I don't think Jacob thought I've got to be in control, but he needed it, and it turned the course of his life. And I, where this hit me most strongly, ironically, was when we had to leave the mission field. I was, I was born to be a missionary. I loved doing missions. That was my favorite thing. I had nothing more fun to me than to live overseas and have all those adventures and to be able to do the cool things and spend your guys' money, all that sort of stuff. I loved it. <laughs> and to have to come back to the States and, and, I mean, I love PBC, don't get me wrong, but, but Portland and Oregon, it feels like exile. It feels like Babylon to me. So when Simon was preaching on Babylon, I'm like, yep, that's, that's about how it feels. Because I feel like my promised land is over there, but God's brought me here. But the thing that was the most traumatic for me wasn't leaving people I loved and it wasn't leaving the work I loved. It actually was leaving stability and predictability. We think of missionaries as being constantly living with chaos, but actually, we're human just like you. We really don't love that sort of stuff. We lived in the same house for 16 years. I'd worked at the same organization for 16 years. I'd moved up in the ranks of that to the point of being the director for the last 10 years. I had control of the budget. I had a large staff. Our finances personally had finally become stable. Most of that was chaos for decades. But the last, last two years, we'd finally gotten enough support that every month we had money. It was the weirdest feeling ever. And I'm like, it's working. This is good. I have respect from people. I know what's going to happen next. Yes, there's the burden of leadership and there's difficult things and crises, but like, I, they're ones that I, they're in my wheelhouse. I can handle that. And all of a sudden, God's like, bam, kicks us right back here to Portland. And now I'm the new guy on the team and I'm trying to rent a house and I'm trying to, to make a budget work with only one income and less money than before and higher expenses and health stuff. And it rains here like all the time. And figuring out, so, and I realized, so much of what I loved about the mission field wasn't the holy vision of God, although hopefully I did have vision and faith. So much of what was, it was predictable and I felt in control. And coming back here didn't, and it was terrifying. And that's when Jacob and I became buddies because I began to realize that, you know what? He was the same way. He was terrified. And that's the issue is that control is rooted in fear, often subconscious. You don't get it, but the need to control, that desire is rooted in deep, deep fear. Fear of harm, fear of failure, Fear of pain, whether that's emotional pain or physical pain, it's rooted in deep fears. Number two, fear drives idolatry. Now, in the West, we think of idolatry as metaphorical. You know, I worship, we worship money or prestige or reputation or influence or whatever else. But where I've spent most of my life, idolatry is there's an idol and people are bowing down and worshiping it. There's a sacred tree and people are offering offerings in front of it. There's candles burning. Because, and they're not doing it because they want pleasure. They're doing it because they're scared. Because there's spirits behind everything, and the evil spirits, you need to placate them. And the good spirits, you need to flatter them so that you can control your environment and so that the forces that are outside of your control can be brought under your control and you can get what you need. It's fear-based. Now, here in the West, we don't have a lot for idols, but when we think about pleasure and, and, and success and money, sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that that's, those are the idols. How am I gonna put this? Those are the idols we often pursue but we never ask why we pursue those idols. No one wants money for money's sake. You want money for what it represents. You want money for the fact that it means I'm not gonna have to worry anymore. You think I need a good income, why? So I don't have to trust God as much. So I can just have the money I need to be comfortable. I need influence and success, why? So people think well of me. Why? Because I don't think so well of myself and I need some proof that I'm actually a pretty good person. Most of the time the idols we worship are actually the same thing. We worship what makes us feel safe. We worship what makes us feel protected. And we will do anything to get what we need. 
including cutting corners, including ignoring God, including all kinds, blowing up relationships. If we're driven by fear, we fall into idolatry. And it's good to think about that and to go, okay, what, am I, what do I feel like I would die if I didn't have? What is more important to me than anything else? And if it's not Jesus, <laughs> there's a good chance that there's an idol. And so our reaction then is, oh yeah, well, I've been worshiping and whatever, so I'm gonna stop. I, it, it often requires taking a step back and going, why am I doing that? Well, because I'm scared to death of something else. And I remember times on the mission field where I remember, I remember praying for more money and this voice in the back of my head going, why? And I remember by instantaneous thought thinking, so I won't have to trust God. And then going, well, that was, where did that come from? You're a missionary. That's like what you do. <laughs> but I'm still human. And oftentimes we want that comfort and that safety and that security that comes from not having to, frankly, trust God. So fear drives idolatry. Idolatry is putting our faith in anything other than the power and trustworthiness of God. Number three, the desire to control our environment is universal and it's often healthy. And that's the thing that I want to walk carefully through this because I've heard sermons on surrender, sermons on control. I mean, God's been dealing with me in this topic for years. And sometimes we, we think, well, what we just need to do is just let go and let God, you know, Jesus take the wheel and kind of give up. But actually God has designed us to be stewards of this world. Adam and Eve had a job to do and it was to take dominion. It wasn't just to stand around and passively wait for the fruit to fall out of the trees. They had to actually work to do. And we're built that way as well. You have drive, you have ambition, you have desire, you have goals. Those aren't bad. And if we're not careful when we say, I'm gonna surrender all, it's like, well, no, don't, don't surrender like your God-given responsibilities. <laughs> there is a healthy, a healthy aspect to it. But for most of us, sometimes in some ways at least, it does become unhealthy. And we move from having a God-given desire to do something for his glory to a desperate need to protect and to control and to guard and to get what we need because if we think otherwise, we're not gonna have enough. And it's subtle, and we don't even recognize it sometimes. But if you stop and think, and ask God, the Holy Spirit is really faithful to put his finger on those areas where what you, maybe you could put in good Christian words, I have a vision for this, I have a desire. God's spoken to me, is actually God saying, yeah, but the way you're wanting to go about it is really not quite what I want to do in you, or through you. All right, next slide. In case you're not sure if you've got control issues, Okay, oh, sorry, I got this one first. The problem with control, number one, it doesn't work. Like, you can't control the world. We tried. COVID made it really, really clear how pathetic we all are as a human race at actually controlling things. Supply chain blew up. You couldn't even get toilet paper. I mean, there was crazy stuff going on that shows how little we can actually control our environment. But if you ever had a health problem come out of nowhere or a loved one who passed away unexpectedly or some other major crisis, you've, you re come face to face with the reality that we actually can't control our lives as much as we think. It just doesn't work. Uh, Jeremiah 10, 23 says, Lord, I know that people's lives are not their own. It is not for them to direct their steps. God is sovereign. We don't want to admit it sometimes, but he is. Number two, it produces anxiety. Um, this, is, this is in part because we get a lot more choices. Like here in the States especially, you have so many choices. Go on Amazon and you can pick a thousand different things. How many of you have gone to the Cheesecake Factory for a meal or for cheesecake? Anybody? Okay, some of you aren't admitting it, but it's not a bad place. This is, it's not a setup here. You go there and they hand you this book, right? And it's, it's, it's the menu and you open it and there's like page after page after page after page. And I, I find that stressful. It's anxiety inducing. It's like, wow, I don't know which one, what if I get the wrong one? You know, there's like, there's a there's hundred items on here. I can't afford most of them, so that makes those easy. But it's, there's the more choice we have, the more anxiety we often end up with. I, I don't know this for a fact because I'm not hundred years old, despite what my kids think. But I'm guessing that hundred years ago, when there were fewer choices, there also was some less anxiety in certain areas. Now, anxiety is a human trait, so we've had it forever. But if, you were, if your father was a blacksmith and you're a dude, you're gonna learn how to be a blacksmith by the time you're like eight. You're gonna have a trade. And you may choose to do something different, but you've already got a trade. You don't have the internet to show you what everybody else is doing. So you're gonna probably do what's in front of you. And there's just fewer choices, which sometimes produces a little bit less anxiety. In our case, you can go online and, and, and type in the word, you know, college application. And within two days, all of a sudden, you've got all these people who somehow stole your email address sending you all these applications and ideas and brochures from colleges all over the world. And you're going, I don't know, I don't know, do I pay? Anybody ever been stressed out by the, de the decision of which college to go to or which major to have or, okay, a bunch of liars out there. All right, those, some of you, I remember being in high school, people were like, okay, where are you gonna go to college? It's like, I don't know. And then you pick a college, what are you gonna major in? I don't know. And then you pick a major and they're like, are you gonna date anybody? I don't know. And then you're dating, are you gonna get married? I don't know. 
and then you get married, are you gonna have kids? I don't know, and it felt like every season of life, I just wish I had a t-shirt that had their question, and then like, shut up, I don't know yet. <laughs> the good news is once you have kids, they don't care about you anymore, they just focus on your kids, and the questions stop. But there's a few years in there where it's kind of a pain. Anybody relate? <laughs> and it's stressful if you don't know. It is even stressful if you do know, because you're like, I, I should know, right? Like, everybody's asking me, so I should have an answer. But actually, we, we often don't. So it produces anxiety, and lastly, it harms us and those we love. When we think we have to control everything, we will hurt people. We just will. I mean, for one thing, we're humans, we tend to hurt people regardless, because we're just a bunch of sinful people running into each other. But if, you're, if you are fixated on, I have to control this, you will end up manipulating people without even trying. You won't even realize what you're doing, and you're controlling people. I've done it. I've been guilty of hurting people I love and not even known it till later because I was so fixated on what I needed that I wasn't, didn't realize that even the way I was saying things was putting them in a box or manipulating their emotions. And I got pretty good at it. <laughs> I was taught as a kid that liars go to hell. So I never lied. But I can deceive you with the truth like nobody's business. Some of you are that way too, you know what I mean? You're like, you tell just a half of the truth. And it's so much more potent than a lie. And you'd feel like you haven't sinned because you didn't lie. But they don't understand what's going on. And you can end up using, and Jacob was that way, and we are often that way. All right, next page, because we're running short on, on time. You might be a control freak. If you don't plan, you plot. There's a difference in the flavor. Planning is going, I have these resources and I have this goal, and these are the steps I think I should take to get there. Plotting is a whole different idea. It's like, I need to get to know her, and I need to make sure that they like me, and I need to get myself invited to that event, and I need to be on the stage more because people need to know I have a gift, and then I can get those, and you, you end up with this like long, you know, that complicated, uncontrollable situation where you're trying to make everybody else do what you want to get to the point that you want them to get to. Whole different flavor and a lot more anxiety if you're trying to do the plotting bit, okay? I'm a master plotter. Um, I fell in love in college. Actually, wasn't in love yet. I just saw a girl I was interested in, and she was cute. I knew she wanted to be a missionary. She loved God, but she wasn't a flirt. I tried flirting with her. It didn't work, largely because I think my pickup line was a statistic. Never use a statistic for a pickup line. It's terrible. All right. She responded, as you might expect, and uh, I didn't think about it for another year. And then this girl invited her brother to take her to banquet her sophomore year. And I'm like, the heck? No guy had the guts to ask her out? Because back then in the 90s, you, almost everybody went with a date, even if you were just friends. You, it was just, uh, well, that's, I might have a chance, you know. So the brother shows up the night before the banquet, and it's, he was going to spend the night with somebody else in somebody else's dorm room. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't think so. So I went up, I summoned my inner extrovert. I met this guy, his name was Dust, and I met, made myself as charming as I could. The other guy wasn't there yet, so I said, hey, Dustin, you just want to spend the night in my room? My roommate's gone tonight. He's like, yeah, that's fine. So we spent the night there in the room. I made friends with him. The next day, we did a beach trip together. All summer long, Koya's brother was talking about this nice guy named Jeff. What about Jeff? And I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to pay him. And I had a wingman that whole summer just going, Jeff's a good guy. Jeff's a good guy. We got married about a year later. <laughs> Nothing wrong with an occasional plot. I'm just kidding. I couldn't control that situation, but I was trying to do my very best. Some of it didn't work. I gave her my address and she didn't respond. She, she didn't, he, really the flirting game was not there. But anyway, <laughs> it worked out. All right, if you constantly feel the need to debate others in person, online, or in your head, I win so many arguments in my head, you have no idea. <laughs> Number three, you deal with chronic fear or anxiety. There are a lot of reasons for fear and anxiety. I'm not trying to say that you've got control issues if you have anxiety. It's not that simplistic. But it's worth checking into. It's worth thinking about because our anxiety spikes when we think we have to control the uncontrollable. Number four, you're tempted to cut ethical corners. Number five, you have outsized emotions. That's, that happen, when, when, you, when something doesn't go your way, you don't just go, ah, what a bummer. You want to kick somebody or stab somebody or scream into your pillow or you're melting down. Those emotions that just seem so much greater, they come because the disappointment was much greater than you thought it was going to be because you invested a lot more into that than you even realized. And when you couldn't control the outcome, all of a sudden, all those emotions are a big sign that maybe you were trying to control something that you couldn't. Um, you often have an I deserve better than this mentality. Something doesn't come out, turn out right. And you're like, that's not fair. I didn't deserve that. That's not right. And, and there are situations where you didn't deserve it. So again, take these with discernment. But if you're constantly saying, I didn't deserve this, this isn't right, there's a decent chance you're trying to control a lot of stuff that God never intended you to control. You can't tolerate uncertainty without panicking. All right, next, next one, ways we try to control others. 
You can just take a picture of that if you want. I'm not gonna talk about all those. These are, these are common sense. They're ones that we all understand, but I wanted to throw them up there just so I felt like I was, was com complete in my notes. But I wanna focus on, on what actually happened in Jacob's life because that's what really matters. So those are ways that we might control others. Go to the next slide, Genesis 32. By the way, if you don't get all this down on you, one of those kinds who likes notes, I'll give you my notes, I don't care. Text me afterwards and you can have them. Um, Jacob, in Genesis chapter 32, this is where Jacob's life Hits, hits a point where he can no longer pretend to be in control. He's annoyed, irritated, backstabbed, or frustrated or stolen from almost everybody in his life. He's got a dysfunctional relationship with his wives and his kids, but he's getting ready. He's just left fleeing from Laban because Laban's kids are mad at him, and he's going out in the desert, and he finds out Esau's coming after him with 400 armed men, and he's stuck. He can't outrun Esau now. He can't outwit Esau anymore. He knows this guy's coming for blood, and he begins to panic. So he prays, and you can skip down to, um, oh, I didn't put the prayer in there, sorry. <laughs> I wrote it. Uh, I knew we wouldn't have time for this. So he prays to God, and in that prayer, it's earlier in the chapter, he actually finally says, God, you're the one who's given me all that I have. You're the one who has to protect me. Please protect me. And he finally, in a sense, gives up control. Not completely, because he then, and you see in these verses here, he then begins to give away things, or to give presents and sort of bribes to Esau to try to save himself. But then, then the strangest, one of the strangest stories in the whole Bible happens. And it's, it's on, you, on, the, on the PowerPoint here. Verse 23, after he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. Just kind of random wrestling match, just out of the blue. Just like, huh, there's a guy in the desert. Why don't we fight? Does that not seem strange to you? It gets weirder. When the man saw he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. And Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what's your name, Jacob? Then he said, your name will be no longer Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob says, tell me your name, and it goes on there, and, and he walks away limping. This story is most, one of the most bizarre stories ever. It, it, God himself, or potentially an angel of God, depends on who you read, is wrestling with Jacob. Now, I, I picture it. Jacob's there pacing up and down. He knows Esau's coming. He's freaked out. This is his last night on planet Earth, quite possibly. And he's panicking, and it's the middle of the night, and he's in the desert, and a man comes, and everything inside of Jacob's just, ah! He attacks him. Like, there's no more subterfuge, no more deception. They just begin to wrestle, and they fight all night long. If you've ever done wrestling, matches don't last all night long. Like, it's like, what, a minute, two minutes? And then you're both gasping for air. These guys wrestle the whole night. And then in the, in the, in the morning, the guy's like, you know what, this just does not work. And Jacob's down there. Okay, guy just touches his hip, and all of a sudden, Jacob's doing this. And Jacob had to know he couldn't win. At that point, he realizes this is, this is not a normal wrestling match. This guy just touched my hip, and it went out like that. But he doesn't let go. And this is what I want to leave you with. Jacob doesn't let go. He wasn't wrestling against God. He was wrestling for the blessing that he knew God had promised him. He did it wrongly for most of his life. He lied and he cheated and he stealed to get what God wanted, but he always knew what he wanted and he knew what he wanted was the blessing of God. When he was fighting for the birthright, it was the blessing of God. Did he do it wrong? Yeah. Did it sow some bad seed? Yep but he had a tenacious commitment. Can you go to the next slide to serving God? And this is where I want, what I want us to see. What Jacob got wrong was he thought he had to control his environment by any means necessary. But what he got right, he was tenaciously committed to receiving God's blessing. We've got to give up control. We've got to give up the outcomes and surrender our plans, but we have to continue to passionately pursue what God has given us. And that's the part that always rubbed me the wrong way because so many times I thought, well, if I just give up, then it's just like, okay, God's gonna do what he's gonna do and I'll just sit around and, I don't know, drink coffee till Jesus comes. But that doesn't sit well with me because I'm an achiever, I'm a doer. I wanna compete, I wanna win, I wanna, I wanna accomplish something. Even if I'm hiking, I wanna climb a mountain. Like, that's just who I am. And a lot of you are that way too. You've got goals and aspirations and dreams and ambitions and God has put them in your heart. God's not asking you to lay that down. He's asking you to trust him with the outcome. The blessing God's given you is not meant to say, well, we're not gonna do it. We'll just kind of sit around and sing worship songs and Jesus will kind of just drag us into the kingdom of God. No, he's called us to work and to work hard. But we're not responsible for the outcome itself. And when we can find the balance of those two, then all that God-given energy has an outlet. I wanna work hard. 
but I don't want to work hard because I'm scared to death I'll fail. I want to work hard because I'm excited to see what God has promised is going to come to pass. And there's a completely different attitude that comes when you've got that versus the, oh no, I've got to fix everybody and everything. And oh no, she's mad at me and now my life is over. That's not ever going to get anywhere but anxiety. But if we can focus on, the, on what God has called us to do, then we win. Last slide. On the practical side of things, control the one thing you can. You. You can't control. I've tried to control Koya before. It doesn't work. She's really stubborn. I've tried to control my kids. I can't. I can out persuade them once in a while until they became teenagers and now they can out argue me so it doesn't work. But I can control myself. Not completely. My health is still outside of my control to some extent. There are still some tragedies that could happen. No, none of us has 100% control. But how many times do we find ourselves complaining and, and plotting and trying to figure out something that actually is in God's hands and completely ignoring the part that's in our hands? So we're saying, God, I can't make my school payment. It's just way too much. I need you to miraculously bless me. And we interrupt our prayer time to call for Grubhub to bring us a $15 lukewarm burger for McDonald's. We could have walked and got ourselves, you know. And God's up there going, you know, maybe of all the choices to eat, if you're going to poison yourself, there's cheaper ways to do it. Eat some grass. Do something. <laughs> Cook. And we want to obsess over the things we cannot change and ignore the things that we can. There's a lot in my life that I can change, that I can do. There are so many things that I can. So I gave you some points there. We don't have time to deal with all of them. Time always moves faster when I'm up here. It's like some sort of a divine, I don't know. Meditate on God's word. Let's truth rewire your brain. Be honest about your emotions. This has been a big one for me. Don't just push him down. Use him as a, as, a, as a symptom checker. Like if my leg hurts, I don't go, I rebuke you, leg. I go, okay, maybe I'm stepping on something I shouldn't be. Oh, yeah, that's a nail. Move. If you got anger, you got fear, you got those sorts of things, why? Ask yourself why. Don't just d rebuke it. Don't be anxious. Be anxious for nothing. Well, actually, that doesn't work. If you're anxious, fix it. Find what the problem is. Get some help. I could preach that one for an hour, but I won't because then you guys would all be gone. When God speaks, obey. Let God redeem every part of your personality. Guess what? We get to be shrewd. Jesus said, be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. So if you're a little bit devious, God can redeem that. If you're a bit of a plotter, God can actually redeem that. If you are stubborn and strong-willed and always annoy people, God can redeem that. I strongly suspect Martin Luther was a pain in the butt to be around. He was aggravating and annoying and always just nailing things on doors and stuff. Changed the face of the, changed, changed the course of Christianity. God can redeem those things that you have, but we've got to get back to the heart of we're doing it, not because we have to control the future, but because God is our God. He's controlling it and we're partnering with him. Oh. So frustrating. All right, we got two and a half minutes. Go ahead and stand to your feet. <laughs> I wanted to have an altar call because I want to have some response time, but I also am aware of, of time and people needing to go. So we're going to just have to do the, the quicker version. Go ahead and stand up. I don't know if I have a piano player to bring the Holy Spirit or if we should just trust you. All right, awesome. <laughs> I'm just kidding. The need to control is a human problem. It's not just one or two of us. Every one of us deals with this at one level or another. But I felt as I was praying this, for this that there are some people here that for you, this resonates deeply. This isn't the first time you've heard this. The Holy Spirit's been speaking to you for days, weeks, months, maybe years, and you know there's some areas in your life that you need to give up. Aunt Koya was praying this morning and she felt strongly that there are some people here that you've got an issue you're trying so hard to control that it's now controlling you. You've become fixated on it. It's not a thing you need to solve. It's, it's become your boss, your, your God in a sense. And it's time for us to lay those down. God never stopped loving you. God's blessings never stop being available to you. We don't have to be in charge of all of that. We can give it to God. We can lay it down and still fight and still be strong. The picture I had the other day is of people kneeling down, praying, surrendering from their heart and God putting a sword in their hands as they kneeled. Because you're called to surrender, but you're not called to stop fighting. You're called to give up control of the outcome. You didn't have control of that in the first place, so stop worrying about it. But you're not, control, not called to stop going forward. There's a world to save. There's a people to reach. There are, there are businesses to be built. There are schools to start. There are churches to plant. And you're going to do it. But Jesus said, I will build my church. Not you will build this church. Starts and ends with Jesus. All right, can you raise your hands? If that's you, you don't have to come forward. I know we don't have time, but I want you to give it to God right now. Father, we are so, so grateful that you have created us 
the way we are. But Lord, we are thankful that even when we are snakes and even when we are deceptive and even when we are self-deceived, you still are faithful. Though we are faithless, you still continue to be faithful. And I pray for every person in this room who might feel like they, they are trying to grasp a control that you have not called them to have, Lord, that we would be able to surrender that to you today that you would redeem every aspect of our personality, that you would help us to find the balance of, of pursuing with passion the things that you've called us to do and to be while not trying to control the things that are uncontrollable. Lord, you are so faithful to be, complete the work you began in us. And we give ourselves to you again today. We thank you that you are greater and more powerful and more loving and more good than we will ever imagine. In Jesus' name, amen.